everybody. Good morning to you. Happy Sunday to you. Happy first Sunday of 2024 to you. Happy New Year to you. Happy Ravens are the number one seed Sunday to you. <laughs> Hope you had a fantastic Christmas and a very Merry New Year. If you have a Bible, I'd like for you to get to the uh, fourth chapter of the book of Exodus. And I want us to check out something that happened. This is really early on in the Bible. And this is where God comes to Moses, a pretty famous character in the Bible, Moses is. And God comes to Moses, and God calls Moses into something. Moses had been out in the wilderness where he had been employed as a sheep herder for his father-in-law, Jethro, for 40 years at this point in time. And God comes to Moses and essentially says to Moses, Moses, I got something for you to do. And he told Moses that he wanted him to step into the role of being a significant leader for his people. He had a big-time task for Moses to tackle, and he lays it all out before Moses there. And Moses' response was uh, very, very interesting. Moses said, I'm not your guy, God. You got the wrong guy, right? I mean, clearly there's been some sort of mix-up because I'm just a sheep herder. And God says, Nope, you're the guy. I want you to be the spokesperson, and I want you to lead my people. I, I want my people to follow you, Moses. And then Moses rolls out all this, this list of excuses, one right after the other, as to why he shouldn't do this. Moses says, I'm not a great speaker, God. Like, you want me to be a leader, but I'm not a great speaker. I fumble all over my words. In fact, my brother Aaron Aaron, he's a good speaker. You should go to him. He should be your guy. You should ask him to do this. Aaron's your guy, God. And God says, nope, Moses, you're the guy I want. But Moses, he kind of insists there in this little back and forth. He's like, man, they're never going to believe me. They're not going to believe that I'm from you. I just don't know about all this. And so eventually, God asks Moses this question now that, that I think is a really good question for us to ask today. And here's the question that God asked Moses. God says to Moses, Moses, what is that in your hand? What's in your hand, Moses? Now, some of you know Moses had in his hand a simple walking stick, a, a shepherd's staff. And God tells Moses, he says, you got me? You got that stick? I can work with that. It's going to be awesome, right? But Moses is still a little sketchy, so God does a little series of miracles right then and there with Moses to try and assure him a little bit. But essentially, God says to Moses, Moses, if you just have faith and if you obey me and if you do what I ask, I'll take care of everything else. I'll help you. I'll be with you. I will teach you. I'll guide you. Trust me, Moses. And what's interesting is God used what was in Moses' hand, that sim simple shepherd's staff, to move Moses to a place where he eventually went where God wanted him to go and did what God wanted him to do. And what's so fascinating is that shepherd's staff, that stick, that walking stick, played a major part in some incredibly significant events. In fact, when the Israelites were trapped against the Red Sea, Moses held up that stick. As long as he held up his arms, held up that stick, the Red Sea parted and they escaped on, on dry land. Later, when they needed water in the desert, Right? All the people needed water. Moses struck the rock with that stick, and water began to flow from it. God used what was in Moses' hand. What's in your hand? Now, I bring this up because people often ask me, they say, Dave, how's the church going? Like, I'll be out somewhere. I'm at some event. I'm at some family gathering. I'm at the barber shop. You know, wherever I go, People usually ask me, Dave, how's the church going? So how do you answer that question when somebody asks it? Like, are we talking about how full the building is? Is this like an attendance kind of thing? Are we talking about the number of baptisms or the number of people serving or the number of people in groups? Are we talking about the budget? You know, talking about the financial picture of the church? Is it how we're doing compared to other churches or maybe the national average? How exactly do you frame up the answer to how's the church going? 
Well, I think about Moses. God comes to Moses, got something for him to do. And he asks that question, what's in your hand? And, you know, God has some things for us to do. God has a job for us to do, too. And that same question that came to Moses comes to ask us, what's in your hand? In fact, I'd like for you to think about that for just a second. Jesus once said in the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter, he said, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So a question is, would we be in the category of those who have been given much? Would you be in the category of someone who has been given much? What do you have? Like, think about this again for a, 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 on a personal level for just a second here, okay? You can kind of think of this as like a blessing inventory. This is a really good exercise to do, particularly at the beginning of a year. Here at the beginning of 2024, what is in your hand? What have you been blessed with? What have you been entrusted with? What has God given to you, right? And I'll just go through a couple categories here, and you think about your own life, okay? Like, for starters... You're alive. You have that. You have a life. How much is that worth? That's a gift. And, you know, some of you, well, actually all of us, all of us have some things that we're skilled at. Some of you have incredible abilities. You know, you're able to sing or organize or plan or create. Some of you are incredibly skilled at relating to people or encouraging people or listening to people. These are all things that have been entrusted to you. These are things that you hold in your hand. Think about this. You have a body. You have some level of energy. You have some time. You have some mental health. Like you're in touch with reality. At least this service is, you know. <laughs> and you have experiences. You have what you've learned so far in your lifetime. You even have difficult experiences you've gone through in your life. You know, it's a rather incredible thing. God often uses our difficulties and challenges, sometimes even more than he uses our strengths. A lot of times people who have experienced great loss or wrestled with an addiction or gone through a deep depression, they're able to best help other people in that same situation because God never wastes a difficulty. You know, some of you, you've been given a great deal of education. Some of you have relational networks. You have, you have a, a group of friends, financial resources. I mean, think about all these things. It's all entrusted to you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, think about this. Think about the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life because of Jesus Christ. You hold that in your hand. What's in your hand? What has God given you? I mean, most of us realize it is so, so very much. And then you think collectively as a church, you know, what have we been given? Have, have we been given much? Well, I mean, my goodness, you start with the gift of freedom to gather together and worship like we're doing here today, which a lot of Christians around the world don't have. And then you think about the history of the church down through the ages and our brief history as a church, our 17 and a half or so years, you know, and you think of our leadership and you think of our staff team, you think of the volunteers, you think of the hospitality of so many and the willingness of so many and the, the servant hearts of so many. You think about experiences that we collectively have and resources. And then you think about just the blessing of being a place where we can come just like we are in spite of our brokenness. These are all gifts from God. We didn't earn them. You understand? We, didn't, we don't deserve them. We, we don't merit them. And no gift, no gift makes any person any more important or any more valuable than any other person, you see. But you think about the blessing factor for our church. What would you all say is the blessing factor of our congregation? Oh, it's off the charts. Would you agree? It's off the charts. I don't think there's any question about that. Through absolutely nothing to do with anybody meriting anything, you have been given this off the charts blessing for our church. 
And then you think about this. This is another really important factor. What are the spiritual needs of our area? You may think of it like this. What's the spiritual needs factor for this area? And let's just think about this for, for just a little bit here. Like it doesn't matter what you know, group you kind of look to, the Association of Religious Data, you know, Pew Research, Barna Group. They all kind of have conclude the same sort of percentage of our population here in this country. And it's somewhere between, it depends on where you are in the country, but somewhere between, let's say, 20 to 30 percent. I'll just use round numbers. 20 to 30 percent of the population in our country actually are a part of a church. Okay? It's a little less in some places. It's actually a little less than that here in Baltimore County specifically. A little more in other places, but let's just say 20 to 30 percent. And what that means is that 70 to 80 percent of the people that are walking around our country, they're not a part of any church, which means they don't know God. They're not connected to God. The two are connected to, to, together, being a part of a church and connected to and walking with God. See, So that seven out of 10 people that you see walking around, eight out of 10 people that you see walking around, and then let's make this a, a little bit even more personal, all right? I bet you have some people that you care about. And I want to make this as, as concrete as possible. A lot of times, well, actually, I would say all of us, we have pictures of people that we carry around all the time, don't we? You know how we do that now? Through our phones, right? Through our phones. Now, some of you still have like the old school. Anybody still got some of the old school in your pocketbook or your, your wallet or something like that? You have hard pictures, but most people do that with your phones. I would love for everybody here, again, just to try and make this as concrete as possible, everybody physically right now, I would like for you to pull out either your pictures that you have of somebody or your phone, which is very simple for many of you to do because you've already got your phone out, all right? <laughs> Been messing with it or, you know, but just pull that out, pull up your photos, you know, whatever it is, and I want you to pull up a picture of somebody or some bodies that you care about, all right? And if you would, I'd love for you, if you're cool with this, I would love for you to show it to somebody that you're sitting next to and just say, I care about that person right there. If the only picture you have is your driver's license, pull out your driver's license and show it to the person and say, I care about that person right there. If you have grandkids, tell everybody why your grandkids are better and smarter and cooler than everybody else's grandkids. Take a moment, share, ready, set, go for it. Okay, now a question, okay? Think about the people in your life that you love. And a show of hands on this one. How many of you would say there is at least one person in your life that you love and you are concerned about their spiritual well-being? Just raise your hand and just look around the room. Just look around the room. Now think about what God sees. See, the Bible says that God loves everybody. God loves every human being on the, on the planet. Jesus died for everybody. You will never look at anybody for whom Jesus did not go to the cross for. He suffered and died and rose again so that everyone, if they want in on it, everyone would have the opportunity to know God and walk with God and experience God's love and receive God's love and walk with him, you see. So when God looks at our planet and God looks... At our part of the planet, God looks at our country and God looks at our state and God looks at our county and God looks at our area and he sees messed up families and he sees people with no direction or purpose 
or hope or peace. When God looks at, at our part of the world and he sees sexual confusion and promiscuity, he sees rampant arrogance and cynicism and violence and a value system that's just plain goofy. And God sees people who know nothing of Jesus. They don't think about him. They don't think about him or sin or repentance or their soul, not because they've thought it all through and come to some conclusion, just because they live in a culture that is so rampantly secularized. He sees people who hold to a general spirituality that's not based on anything at all. It's not rooted in anything at all. Or people who think of church as just kind of a joke, kind of a punchline. How do you think when God looks at our area that he loves what the spiritual needs factor of our area is? Well, that's off the charts too. When people ask me, well, how's the church going? I think about how much we've been given. I think about the great spiritual need all around us. And I think about this too, what might be called the God multiplier factor. Because there's this interesting theme in the Bible. It comes up a number of places, and I'll mention just a couple of them. When people with humility offer what they have to God, God multiplies it. Like one time Jesus is teaching a crowd, and they don't have anything to eat, and a little boy comes up. He has five loaves and two fish. What does Jesus do? He multiplies it. He feeds thousands and thousands of people. Jesus is a multiplier. God is a multiplier, you see. Jesus is telling a parable one time, a terrific parable. It's one of my favorite parables. But Jesus is telling this parable one time about a sower and some seeds. And the same principle is at work here. And here's what Jesus says. The Gospel of Mark, fourth chapter says, Some people hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. 30, 60, or even 100 times. See, the real leverage of human contribution is not just about our gifts, not our gifts alone, not about just our strengths and our gifts, but it's when we enter into a divine dynamic. It's when God multiplies it. It's when we get, get involved in and get caught up in the divine multiplier effect. Jesus says they get multiplied 30 or 60 or even 100 times. Now, what do you think? Like the blessing factor for our church and for you is off the charts. The spiritual needs factor for our area is off the charts. Our congregation, God looks down. What's the multiplication factor you think God would like to use with us? 30 times? 60 times? 100 times? Like what is God's aspiration for our church? What's off the charts, wouldn't you say? Because Jesus is a multiplier, do you see? God is a multiplier, and this is his church. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. This is what I'm up to now. People sometimes say, what's God up to now? Like, what is it? Okay, Jesus died, rose again. What's he doing now? He's building his church. He said, I will build my church, and not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. It will prevail. Nothing will defeat it. Nothing will overcome it. So we should be so courageous and bold and eager and fired up about his church, you see. See, the idea is that you take whatever has been entrusted to you, whatever is in your hand, and you offer it, and you step into a divine dynamic with God at work, filling in the gaps, and you do this for the sake of the people that you love, the people around you, the world around us. You do that. That's a good 2024, wouldn't you say? I have reached a point in my life where I am keenly aware that every day counts. The clock is ticking. There were some game on earlier this week, a basketball game. It was a college basketball game. We weren't watching the basketball game. It, the TV was just on. It was left on from whatever was before. But the camera had zoned in on this one kid, and they were focusing in on him for a while. And he had done something. Again, we weren't watching, so we weren't really sure what he had done. And maybe he made a shot or missed a shot. You know, maybe he turned the ball over or made a steal. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's something good or something bad as to why they were focused on him. But they zoned in on him, and he was sitting on the bench there. He was catching his breath. 
And the camera just lingered on him for a while. And he looked so young. <laughs> He's just a kid. And my wife, Melanie, she remarked to me, she said, he looks so young. You know, David, we're getting old when the college kids look younger than our kids. That's <laughs> what she said. I have more days behind me now than I have ahead of me. I'm quite sure. And I couple that with the fact that just this past week, my father-in-law, he uh, had a birthday, he turned 86 on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, he and my mother-in-law marked 60 years of marriage together. But then yesterday morning, he passed from this life into the next. You see, every day matters, gang. No day is guaranteed. But here's the deal. This is our day. This day is our day. Others have had their day before us. Moses had his day. Peter had his day. Esther had her day. Mary Martha had their day. Samson had his day. Saul had his day. The Apostle Paul had his day. Everybody gets a day. But this is our day. What are you going to do with your day? I mean, this is why the Apostle Paul writes, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. God in Jesus is doing something right now. That's why Paul says, be very careful then how you live because we get so careless about it all, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. See, I want to be a part of a group of people who say we will take whatever has been entrusted to us, whatever is in our hand, and we will give it to realize the redemptive potential God has set before us. I want to be a servant and a brother and a fellow soldier in an army of spirit-infused purpose that is rolling back a tide of secularism and general feel-good spirituality. This is our day. We have some really great plans for our church in 2024 this year. In a little over a month, you know what's going to happen on February 11th? You know what February 11th is? It's the Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> and the Ravens are going to be there, are they not? Yeah. February 11th, Super Bowl Sunday, but it is also a time where we're launching a couple of things. We're launching on February 11th, we're adding another service. Our services are quite full. We've been looking at this for a while. We've been watching, you know, the numbers for a while, and it's time. And so we're going to add a third service on a Sunday morning. Uh, it'll be for those of you who are early birds, which not many of you in this service <laughs> We'll be adding an 8.30 service, 9.45, and then an 11 o'clock service as well. And that's happening on February 11th. We are also, what, are you clapping because it's like, whew, 11 o'clock still here? <laughs> Afraid we were going to go 6, 8, and 9.30 or something? Like what? So third service, February 11th. We're also launching what we call an alignment series. We call that kind of behind the scenes. It's where we ask everybody to focus on the same thing for a period of time. We'll be focusing on something um, that will lead up to Easter. But we also ask all small groups to focus on this during that period of time, six to seven weeks. And we ask everyone to jump in a small group during that time and talk about this same focus as well. So an alignment is happening, launching on February 11th as well. 
You know, our student ministry has been going gangbusters. You know, they got some great plans this year. Winter retreat's coming up. They resume their in-person, you know, uh, large group gathering next week. The pantry is stocked and ready to serve. Art beat's going to happen again later this summer. You know, another round of The Bible Made Possible will take place a little bit later this year. We've got programs like Fit to be Tied and Divorce Care and Grief Share and Starter Group and Guys Breakfast, Food Truck Sundays, Special Hospitality Sundays, Service Trips are in the work. I mean, we are committed to the Bible and we are devoted to each other and we are persistent in prayer and we are eager to bless. 2024 could be a special, special year, but only as far as as we each decide to enter into a divine dynamic and offer ourselves to partner in God's work. How's the church going? I think God actually comes to us just like he did Moses. I think he has placed before us some work to do. We have some jobs to do. And I think that question comes to us, and it comes each, to each of us individually. What's in your hand? What have you been given? It's so much. And we got our excuses too, don't we? But we have the blessing of God, the blessing factor, the need factor. And God is saying, let's go. Today is your day. Now is your time. Let me come back to this third service. Because here's what it will take to pull this third service off. We have about 400 volunteers who volunteer in some capacity around CCC. And that may sound like a lot to some of you, but it represents less than half of our church. It doesn't even represent half of our church. 400 people, but they they step in, they serve in all kinds of ways. We have people who set up baptistry tank, tear it down, you know. Whenever somebody's baptized, we had somebody baptized during the first service today. We have people who serve in worship arts, you know, musicians, singers, People who turn knobs and and make sure it all works appropriately. We've got people who work on front line and they do so much hospitality and serving behind the scenes. They clean up after you all. Every time you come in here, you know, you're a bunch of pigs coming in here and (laughs) you you, you you make a big mess. Well, people come in and they clean that up and they fix coffee and they clean bathrooms and they, you know, just make it all happen. They help you park. Did you know that we have a group of people that clean up after the geese every single Sunday morning? Yes. I don't, you know, I don't know if many of you are geese fans. I am not. So feel free to take one with you today. On your way home. Happy New Year, kids. You know. We have people that do that. I show up early to do that. We have people who volunteer as small group leaders and children's ministry volunteers and student ministry, all kinds of ways. The pantry, there are just uh, you know, dozens and dozens of ways to serve and offer whatever is in your hand, passion, giftedness, you know, energy, whatever it is. And it will require 50 more people who are not currently serving in order to pull this third service off and make it happen. And so I, I, for just a second, if you volunteer around CCC currently, I'm not talking to you. You can like check out for just a second or two. For the people who are not serving currently, I am asking for you to step into this divine dynamic and help to make this happen. Because everybody matters to God. Everybody. Everybody. And the spiritual need factor is sky high. It's off the charts in our area. And so we want to make room for more people to find their way back to God. So we're adding a third service. 50 more people. You should have seen that card that was on your seat when you came in here this morning. You can fill that card out. You can take it to the welcome center. You could t- There's actually an area in the lobby where you can have a conversation with somebody. It's a volunteer area. And you can explore, like, okay, well, what's the need, and how could I potentially help, and what does that exactly look like, and and all those things. You can start having the conversation as we've got, you know, a few weeks, a month or so before we launch this third service, okay? How's the church going? Well, that's kind of up to how we respond, isn't it? 
This is your day. Now is our time. What's in your hand? Let's pray together. Father God, we are so very grateful that you are a giver and you have given to us again and again and again so abundantly. Sometimes, Father, we, we look at what we don't have so much. We focus on what we don't have. We want to refocus our eyes, Father. We want to be faithful to what you have entrusted to us. We have been given so much. So we're looking to you today. We're grateful that you invite us into this wonderful work of your kingdom and your church. It is such a privilege to be a part of your work. We celebrate that today. We want to be faithful there too. Today, Father, we kind of putting a stake in the ground. We want to be faithful with our day. Help us to that end, Father. Thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.